Hang on. Hey, welcome to Coffee Compiler Club. We're here to talk about compilers and language runtimes and typing systems and, and garbage collection and whether to nil or not to nil and all things to do with whatever. And it's an open mic and the conversation rambles about and you're all being recorded live and you'll show up on YouTube generally within a couple hours. Um, so whenever I get around to it. Um, I reserve the right to moderate, never had to do it. Not really. So that's it. Um, we have a bunch of new faces. So, um, well, here's Shaw. Why don't we go with you first? You're like 10 seconds of what you're doing and why you're here and what you're doing. Uh, wrote the mini VM virtual machine, a WebAssembly compiler, and I'm currently writing a just-in-time compiler for it. For the WebAssembly? For mini VM. Both, actually, but the, the WebAssembly one's a little secret. And Throw a link. working compilers, too. So, Throw a link to mini VM uh, in the doc. And if you can't find the doc, throw it in the chat and someone will move it to the doc. And I have to go, now I've buried my windows. I have to go find my copy of the doc who doesn't have Theodore's stamp in it. So I need to go do that. Oh, that's a crap. All right. Scroll down some lines and throw it down past the title and I'll, I'll sort it out here. It'll take a minute. That sounds really, really awesome, actually. What, what's your, what's your uh, plan or strategy for jitting code here? You're doing a, a, a I want to say, so trace-based or? I'm doing a early basic block versioning with quickening interpreter. So that that's, if, if you know what that means. But then each of those basic blocks, once they're called twice, it jits them using uh, the DynaSem tool from LuaJit. Um, and okay. I'm working on porting this to my WebAssembly engine. But it, it, use, it basically distills the dynamic runtime types into static types in the JIT lazily, but as and type errors as early as we are certain that there will be a type error in the future. So that's, yeah, it's, that's my strategy. It also has a garbage collector that runs completely in parallel and um, doesn't ever pause. It only pauses for an atomic pointer write, but. Yeah. The single threaded uh, only works with single threaded or? Um, uh, you can allocate on multiple thread threads, but you can only free on one thread. So the the freeing thread is a separate thread to the main thread. It in in my case, but you could technically just wait for the freeing thread. Uh, but you you don't have to. There's never any need to wait for the garbage collector. It has. Um, Are you writing your own memory allocator? Uh, it can allocate using libc's malloc sberk uh, mmap or just give it a big array and it'll allocate from there. So uh, it does have its own allocator, but it usually allocates over a big buffer. So wherever you can get a big buffer, this will run. So you do have like uh, implementation code of like how to allocate. It's not just like using malloc every time. It calls malloc maybe 10 times for the whole program. It doesn't, it doesn't like spam malloc essentially. It just it just allocates a big enough buffer that it thinks is good. And if it runs oh. out of that, it just makes a bigger one. I wrote a few allocators and they're tough. Yeah, uh, mine is specifically garbage collected and jitted, which is uh, it, it, the allocator is aware of both the garbage of the garbage collector and the jit, which makes it like like some like few thousand lines. But uh, it ends up being very small in code because most of it can be elided at runtime and just like jitted in, which is helpful. But yeah, not having dynamic type tags makes garbage collection a little easier if you just know the type statically of, of what the shape of objects is. So let me back up because I was busy doing things. We have a fellow who usually does stuff who's out for an hour. And so I'm playing oh, catch up here. Mark and sweep. About. Yeah, but, but you said something about static types, which is all normal. You know, Java world is all static types, but you still have to look at the tags because the garbage collector doesn't know what he's looking at until he looks at type tags. It versions the objects into different places depending on their type. So because I have basic block versioning, I can, the, the VM can basically put things in different allocators based on their types and things that don't reference any other objects can be like leaves and can just be owned entirely by another object. 
So reference count can be part of type in this case because type is something at runtime in the system and you, you can statically count? type it. Are you um, the reference counting is kind of used to make uh, the garbage collection a little easier, but cycles are completely possible. Um, uh, there is- um, This is like the Python is, approach. It's reference counting plus garbage collection for cycles. But no, no pauses specifically. The the cycle the cycle checks are are don't depend on. You can write to pointers that are being cycle checked at the same time as you're reading them, and it just writes over them without it. It it, it uses three buffers, three ring buffers, and swaps the second, merges the second into the third, and swaps the first and second. That's the garbage collection cycle, and this means you always have a free space to put your memory. The only time you have to wait is when you're out of memory you have to wait for the garbage collector to run. But I mean, what are you going to do? You're out of memory. So it uses so this is a about... moving garbage collector. Yeah, this is the moves moving are point. just atomic pointer swaps. So the, you just swap two buffers atomically and it ends up, uh, that, that ends up being the move, but the move doesn't happen on the main thread. So it avoids a lot of the- Yeah, okay. So now I'm confused because the usual story of the garbage collectors is I have a pointer in a register and you want to move an object so you want all pointers to move mm -hmm. there's one in my register and this garbage gc thread over there can't touch my register on this thread over there how mm -hmm. do you work that one well so first you look it up you have to actually do three lookups per pointer but intel's intel's memory mapping can handle this uh like on in x86 chips and i working on a way to get it to work on arm but basically you say, if you find it in the first buffer, you found it, then look in the second, then look in the third, otherwise it's a bad reference. So this ends up being three lookups that can be done on an MMU. And if it's in the first buffer, it's fine. And when you garbage collect, you compact the second buffer into the third buffer, but it never actually loses, it never has to change the reference. They never change address, they just change what they are they change okay. index, not address. So it changes what the indexes mean. But because we can do a pointer swap atomically, you can buffer two is merged into buffer three. You have a new free buffer. You, yeah. you swap yeah. buffers one and two, that, that, and that. you now have a free buffer. You have a free space. That, 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 I think I get it. I, what I'm hearing it's, is that you have a read barrier. Mm -hmm. The read barrier is run on every pointer load. And you go through some tests to verify that you have a correct pointer, which you hopefully mm -hmm. do pretty quickly. If yes. you don't have a correct pointer, you have to do some chasing to get a correct pointer. But when you're done, you have a correct pointer. And now the pointer, the corrected version is sitting in a register and is valid and doesn't move ever again. Yeah, you 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 can you can even do pointer arithmetic to the register and it won't like it'll see that it's pointing into the memory at a certain place it's it is it is three move instructions essentially that do the check and then a and then a check on each one the first one that succeeds works but this this is this x86 com processors parallelize this very easily right. and yeah. it usually it it we're not memory bandwidth anyway so like it's yeah. it, so it's Right. Yeah, that's that's in that case. collector does does this in one compare, um, mm -hmm. one load and compare, but there is an extra load and compare uh, per, per memory load and not three in a row, but fine, whatever. Uh, no, what I was coming around to was you said it doesn't move, but you keep saying compaction, which implies moving. If I have a, a large loop running over a billion things and mm -hmm. I need a garbage collect in the middle and I've kept this pointer in a register the whole time, you never move these other objects indefinitely. I'm yeah. So the three buffers are basically the one shadows, the other shadows, the other. And it... That's not what I'm saying. It ends up using three times as much memory. That's the catch. It ends up doing an extra load and three times as much memory. That is the catch. But, but, but uh, still, it, I'm still missing how you handle a case. Okay. Where I've loaded it once into a register. I never load it ever again for the life of the program. I use it continuously in that register. Garbage collection cycles come and go. I want to compact this object that's still alive, still being used by this register, mm -hmm. but I never load it again. How do you change the value in the register? Or do you not move the object? That's what the reference counting is for. It has a reference of, it has a register. 
it has a reference to it from a register. As soon as you oh, write so over that register, the reference count goes down. Okay, so, so yeah, well, you have fat pointers. Yeah, yeah, I'm still missing here. It's in a register. Mm -hmm. It has a reference count that you said was positive, I take it. Yeah. I didn't hear. Of, okay. of one. <laughs> Whatever number it is, suppose I have it in five registers, so it's count of five. I don't mm -hmm. care. Okay, you now not move it? It's now an unmoving value because it has a reference count. Yes. Because okay. it has a register reference count. The reg when you have it in a register, that's the only time its reference count goes higher. It's when, it's when you reference something that has no other references from a register that it needs to reference count. But that is the only time. Uh, Okay, so you have reference counting when I load a value into a register, mm -hmm. and then you don't move those. And upon leaving the register, I have to lower the reference count. Yes. Okay, now next question, is this multi-threaded solution or not? Like you have multi-threaded reference counts or not? Ooh. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> if I think it's one garbage collector per- count, You'll drop a value. I believe it's one garbage collector per thread at this point, but uh, I have to mess with threads more. Uh, it's okay. it's basically double the number of threads and triple your memory for no GC pauses. But this is just my experiment with garbage collection. There's also a bad garbage collector that just it, that just takes weights. But, yeah, right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well. I don't mean to hammer on you, but very cool all, all, all together. And I'm all happy to come back, but we have several new people. So I want to roll yes. around and grab the next new person and see what they're doing. You can be impressed by and hammer on someone at the same time. And, and I'm sorry, do what? I said we can be impressed by and hammer on someone at the same time. Yes, that's kind of normal here. Yeah, we're all polite about it, but we do abuse each other some. Yeah. We're used to getting hammered. Yeah. Y'all missed the chat. I, I gave Cameron some candid feedback upon his video of whatever we were watching yesterday, the two hour talk about ecstasy. And uh, yes. And after that feedback, I got hammered. Yes. Oh, very good. Very good. <laughs> Is that why right. Cameron's looking a little grizzled? Yeah. Oh, and, the, and Theodore may be on late. So the docs just got in shape. So if you put a link, which I see Shaw did, throw it in the docs in the link section as well. And then I'm going to pick on Klaus, who I think was next in line. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, I'm uh, Klaus. Uh, I'm working on languages for like data flow processing or stream processing. Um, like there are some systems right now, like Apache Spark and Apache Flink, which let you like process big and large amounts of data. Streams are large. Which one? Sorry? H2O doesn't do streaming, but it's very large as a competitor to Spark. So are you talking streams or are you talking large? Um, like the goal for us is maybe both like both batch data and streaming data. But the next uh, thing is, is that having run a startup doing big data, when people say big data, they, 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 their explanation or experience of what means big covers six orders of magnitude, six orders of magnitude. Mm -hmm. I've had people say big was exabytes and big was one gigabyte. So, so what do you mm -hmm. think when you say big? Um, I mean, <laughs> I, I'm not exactly sure where the line goes, but for us, maybe it's about the number of sources you can have, like number of data sources. Um, so big is not terabytes or more or less. Big is I have a large count of data sources. Mm, like maybe sensors or uh, mm -hmm. like yeah, you, every source has its own key and then you shard the data uh, among your processing nodes. Mm -hmm. But like uh, the problem we're addressing is like right now you're using mostly either like libraries to write these applications or uh, query languages. And like libraries give you a lot of flexibility because you can use, um, you can write your own user defined functions and execute them. But uh, it's easy to do like 
or write code that doesn't work like because everything is distributed if you try to like make an operation like read this local file from the file system mm -hmm. you don't know what will happen because or you don't know where it will execute in the end um but query languages are like very um i mean they are a more specialized uh, a bit restrictive so you have more control but uh, you can't do anything everything um so we want to like combine some of the ideas uh and maybe the thing that's the things we have uh, that stand out are like we have language integrated queries um we have uh, effect an effect system like asynchronous programming um and uh, we also have like uh, the type system is very structural. Uh, it's not you like you don't need to do many type declarations. Um, and we uh, we transpile the language to to Rust um, to like try to build on what exists already. Okay, you got links. Sounds like it would compile slow. <laughs> yeah, that. That is a problem, um, but the, the programs I think usually they are not that that big, um, and if you use like a workspace, uh, maybe it can speed up. Like the initial compilation is slow, but then it might reuse some. And big data is speak? the classical example of where no one cares about compile speed. Because you know, sometimes the compile will run for hours to do the optimizations, the profile guided optimizations. So it's like if it saves you five percent of the CPU, it might finish two weeks early on 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 some. Right. You're, you're right. I'm just thinking system. debugging the code. Different story, yeah. Well, uh, I had a good experience using TCC. TCC. All right, one at a time. I want to go first. Class, would you can you send us a link? either in the chat or in the, the docs. And if it goes to the chat, we'll move it to the docs. Okay. Yeah, sorry. There's cats here. Um, I would send it. Yeah, okay, cool. And then uh, uh, Levo, what were you gonna say? Oh, I had a good experience uh, transpiling to a TT, uh, T tiny C compiler. Yeah. You can uh, okay. use, uh, you can use uh, Clang's and GCC's sanitizer to make sure you don't have undefined behavior and catch other problems. So, and TCC is fast. Uh, so if you're trying to debug uh, your library or something that you depend on in your uh, big data uh, query, it's like, it's not gonna be too long to like edit a change in your library, wait, like you don't wanna wait like a couple of minutes every change just to see if like your results are correct in like a small sample. Just optimize your edit, compile, debug cycle time. Um, and then Cameron, you were gonna say something or? Oh, wait, waiting room Cameron. I have two Camerons. Okay, why do I have two Camerons? Because I'm too good. Well, that kind of answered the question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, I'm going to nuke the one that has no video. Look, like you did already. Okay, fine. <laughs> uh, okay, good enough. Um, Stefan. You want to? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. So um, I'm working on a compiler for my game uh, where I want to embed a little language, but it's also uh, like something I wanted to do for a long time. I made like lots of uh, interpreted languages before, but I never made a compiled language. And I was like, how hard can it be? And now it's six months later. But, <laughs> but I, I just printed Hello World today. So it's pretty good. Excellent. Nice. Excellent. Yeah. I've known many a game developer that put Lua JIT into their game and then months later cursed at it and pulled it out. <laughs> yeah, like I, I, I want like full control. I I have my own assembler, everything, no no uh dependencies. So stat and, uh, ahead of time compilation, basically. Yeah. Yeah, but it's I mean I'm not doing a lot of optimizations. It's just like very simple stuff. And then mm -hmm. uh register allocation. Yeah, that was actually uh, that was uh, a headache <laughs> because there's so many things that I didn't think about. Like, 
all the fixed registers that uh, you need to take care of and all the stuff. And I want it to be like uh, O of N, like compile speed. More, right. I, I, I care a lot about compile speed. So uh, oh, that was really. You, you and Levo should have a conversation about compile speed. Of course, Levo, you punch it to TCC, which is totally fine. It's just, you know, how fast does TCC go? Well, that's pretty fast. You did both. Well, it only took me a month to implement. So it's probably faster than figuring out regular uh, register allocations. Yeah, yeah, register allocation is a black hole. That's why I brought it up. You can spend all the time in the universe on it. No, yeah, no. and also my first implementation, I was like, oh, it works fine. I'll do spilling later. But then once I needed spilling, I had to refactor everything. Nothing could be reused and blah, blah, blah. Yep. So yeah, yep. big hit. Yep. I should, but actually, I, I feel like the type system uh, is hotter. Sorry. I, I should plug the IU compiler course that I took that... <laughs> Uh, like I just basically, I never went to IU, but I took their online, like they put the videos online. And I just, okay. What's, it. what's the I in IU? Uh, Indiana. Indiana. Yes. They have a yeah. great compiler group. Yes. Yeah. So they, they, they do the nanopass thing, which, um, I ended up not sticking with mostly, but, um, the nice thing about their course is that on the first day you have a working compiler and, uh, but all it compiles is like add or like add an int, you know, right. yeah. int together or something like, but you always, every stage of the way you've got something working and you just layer in features and they start with spilling and then they do register allocation later so that you've got the spill stuff working before, before you do the register allocation and then their register allocation, uh, they do um, like a move biased uh, graph coloring register allocator. Okay. Yeah. And my implementation of their design was 300 lines of code. Like oh. it's pretty straightforward and wow. it's really well explained. And yeah, I basically was able to do it in a week. Right. Right. So I'm sure they pick carefully for that, but sure. Yeah. The C2 allocator and hotspots uh, basically bridge Chaton with a moving bias coloring scheme going on. Yeah. Spilling yeah, got so a little crazy, crazy in it though. Yeah, so it's on my to-do list to to like dive deeply into that and try and understand the, some of the, the things that the, it's doing that's the, more interesting than what I've done so far. Right, the stress points for that is to uh, uh, get larger compilation units so you get more things live. Like like the, the performance bottleneck on Java is inlining. If you inline, though, you get large compilation units. You get large compilation units, you must spell, and you must spell a lot, and that's the stress point. Is it worth I spill everything. another layer in exchange for all the spills you're going to get? Sorry. So, so far, I yeah, sorry. So far, I spill everything. I haven't implemented like uh, like real functions yet. I mean, sorry, I inline everything. Sorry. I haven't. Uh, I but will implement everything. Yeah, so far, but I want to have like dynamic dispatch later, but I haven't. Uh, done I that. was curious about uh, debugging because I heard that a lot of game studios, they don't like the scripting languages because they can't debug it easily. Do you have yeah. a plan for that? Um, I mean, I, I use like LLDB uh, or, yeah, it's really hard to debug. Um, it, it's a giant pain. <laughs> but like if the language was working well, then I would be able to uh, debug, you know, things written in the language. Just like. So you can debug the, you can debug the, in the scripting language inside of the running engine. Like it's not going to try to debug the engine. Um, I mean, I can, well, I haven't inserted it yet, but, uh, I mean, it's deterministic, right? So I could insert, for example, a break, break point or stuff like that and have a, um, LLDB run to that break point and then go from there. But yeah, it's a giant, it's a giant. Okay. Uh, Cause I was nightmare. just curious because uh, like a lot of people said it and it seems like they didn't know a solution. So I was just curious if you had one. No, I, I don't. I, it is a giant headache. But yeah, I, I mean, like uh, instruction level breakpoints, they, they're great. Uh, that, that's my only, the only uh, uh, okay. thing I, I would say. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah, because I had actually issues with the register allocator and I only found out once I used, I, I'm on ARM right now. So once I used 30 <laughs> registers, so it was like, uh, you know, a giant mess. <laughs> 
and then I had to reduce it. But then I just I just removed registers from the allocator, so it, it just like only had four registers, and then I tried to like reduce the example down to that, and then I was able to figure it out. It's like it it has to do with all these conditional branching things, and it's it's a giant giant mess. So Do you try to yeah. generate the dwarf data so the GDB won't hate you. The what? Sorry. The dwarf data. Dwarf. No, no, I don't. Yeah. I thought I, LLVM would do that for you. I don't use LLVM. I don't use anything. I I I have a very. I implemented fifty instructions on ARM, uh, and I'm gonna do the same on uh, x86. And so it's just it's all my own stuff. I, I'm basically also very tired of things that don't cross compile or some crazy bug that I don't know where it's coming from or like slow tools and all this stuff. I kind of just want to get rid of it all. And uh, that's why just, I wrote everything from scratch. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, and also I, I enjoy learning about it. So it's, yeah, might as well. Have you ever spoken with Jonathan Blow? No, I have not. No. I have seen his his videos, but he's he's using LLVM, I think. Not that, uh, yeah. Oh, you mean he's a game designer as well? He's yeah. a game designer as well, who thinks that our tooling is so bad it's leading to the downfall of civilization. Yeah, yeah. I don't I don't yeah. know if I would go that far, but yeah. That's a great video, actually. I really enjoyed it. It's just in some parts were hilarious. I'm gonna make a movie about the downfall of civilization and call it Kubernetes. Yeah. Yes. There you go. I, I don't necessarily agree with his his language choices or his theories on these things, but he's an entertaining guy to, to watch. And he, he's smart, too. He's picking a different set of problems than I'm picking. Hmm. Yeah. All right, Levo, did you do did, did, did this last time, right? The, the stand up in front of everybody and say something. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And oh, I missed this... your first one because I had the internet out right fine it was cameron and whoever and i still have to get that link from you sir you sent it to me and i've lost it in the depths of time really so you didn't post the video no no and i mean at the time you sent it i was still fighting power and winter storm my and... presentation was awful so i think it's fine to not post it. yeah we have to find that and post it yep definitely oh no 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 <laughs> this is this is your bar to improve against <laughs> yeah, I, I have first... a copy, so I can uh, painfully watch it if I want to. But this is just for myself. I gave Cameron, go painfully watch it, and then go redo what you would like to have said. Actually, redo in front of the mirror or just facing yourself, and that's how you get better as a public speaker. And it's one of the ways you get better as a public speaker. You have to practice. It really helps to look yeah. at yourself. How except you it wasn't. Across. Except it wasn't public speaking. It was Zoom speaking. <laughs> uh, okay, but it, it's it's similar enough here. Yeah, I think it's really valuable to give the same talk at two or three different venues, so you can watch the video as painful as that is, and fix things and refine the talk and give it again. Yep, it, it really pays By off. By the third time you give a talk, you realize, oh man, this is much different than the first. Mm -hmm. And you also realize that it's boring now, and you're ready for a new talk. But yeah, it's fine. What's funny is when you're on YouTube and you find two versions of the same talk and one of them's 40 minutes longer than the other. And you're like, wait, what? What happened there? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was part of the advice I gave Cameron is he had way too much talking on, you know, two slides. And I'm like, no, no, no. Two minutes a slide, break it up into smaller slides. Fine. All right, what else? AA update, I'm just plowing ahead. Winter storms have abated for the moment. Power came on last night again, last night. I'm like, one day in three has no power in the mountains, with nothing to do with AA. So we have solar, it doesn't work without batteries. So now we're looking at getting batteries too. And I will be yeah, basically buy, off buy grid batteries. except for cable. One of those power wall type things? Or... Okay, yeah, you could just yeah. buy one of those um, uh, Hummer at EVs and just plug that into your house as power exactly. source. Something like that. A little more brains to it. So, because we, we are still, we can still sell back to PGE at the good rate because we're grandfathered in. 
We have a large solar panel. If I had a large stack of batteries, I can probably be net positive as an energy generator and uh, not only not pay any power ever again, but actually have pg e just pay me a steady set of money every year for positive power. Not necessarily the investment uh, strategy of choice, but <laughs> I, I, I won't have that, a power well, go out in the middle of winter again. Yeah, I thought what usually happened with people who tried to, to do that is that the once the power utility has enough people generating power, they just change the terms so that you have to pay a fixed fee and right. and you so, end up paying the same amount as you did before you installed all the infrastructure anyway. Th th this has happened already. <laughs> so it's called net energy meters, uh, S, I don't know if S is for systems or something. There's one, two, and three. Under version two, you paid and sold back at the retail rate. Under version three, you buy it at retail, you sell it at bulk. They buy it at bulk, right? So yeah. they're going to buy it from you at bulk, but sell it to you at retail. And that's like a four to one ratio. It's pretty substantial, yeah. right? So yeah. we're under NIMS too. We can buy and sell at retail. Oh, wow. So all we're missing now is batteries. We got the solar and under the wire, actually well under the wire. And, and we're, we're, we need to get the batteries so we can actually, the, the best time to sell that is as the sun goes down and everyone's solar runs off and also everyone's home cooking and laundrying and dishwashing and watching TV and playing video games. So that window from six ish to nine ish at night is when the power spike power consumption spikes up. And all those generators they have running around all day that they idle during the day because no one wants them. No one needs them. They have to spin up and those big power plants don't spin up and down easily. So they're happy to buy it. So best time to sell. So class is building streaming straight into the language. Yeah. And Cliff clearly made C2 for doing cluster processing things. He's, he's and Cameron cool. thinks that Kubernetes is going to lead to the downfall of our civilization. Yeah. What do we think should be the line between these sort of distributed clustery kinds of problems and our languages? Obviously, we've had Erlang for a long time, which very much took the approach your language itself should be thinking about the fact that you're running on more than one computer and yeah. how to detect when things failed and when things get restarted. But most of the systems that have been really successful have looked much more like, here's a bunch of Java things that are all being managed by a Kubernetes-like thing that's doing the load balancing. Why don't I we know. think languages that explicitly think about the cluster themselves and bringing up new nodes and shutting down nodes? have taken over. I, I know it makes sense to think about if, if a language, I know it makes sense that a language should know that the program would have to interact with other machines, but I don't think it should know how to run on other machines. No, uh, um, I set my goals narrower to be single machine. Cameron set his specifically to be wider, to be clustered. And I think that's a perfectly fair thing to do. Now, when I built H2O, it does do a cluster and it does do load balancing in the cluster, but it wasn't baked into the language, right? That was, there was no language support. So if you wanted to do clustery things in H2O, you were either doing large 2D arrays that were striped across the cluster, or you had to explicitly play the boilerplate game for launching threads and pulling values out of the KV store and, and the like. And so there wasn't any language support which meant that it was really only done by H2 engineers because the boilerplate was too obnoxious. So I, I think there is a time and a place to do distributed as a language. All right, all right, wait, Klaus, is that a black cat in your lap? Yeah, I, there's two you need, cats you need here. The, suit, the black suit and tie, or the white suit and the black cat and the James Bond theme, sorry. Yeah, so they are a bit, they want to play. Yes, you're paying attention to not the cat, so the cat wants to be involved, yes. Uh, isn't the H2O thing um, mostly on the libraries? H2O is pure Java with basically no other libraries. I mean, it has some libraries, but nothing major. It's, it's, it's just Java. Oh, I thought the workhorse was the library, like where all the efficiency needs came from. No, no, H2O is a large, Distributed, it's, it's a distributed cluster. It gives the illusion of a flat memory space to Java programs who are dealing with 
large 2D arrays. You can write algorithms to it in one of two ways. You can treat it like it's a bulk synchronous parallel array math, which is what mathematicians all do. <clears throat> and they write shit that looks like for i equals one to n, grab from column A and add subtract to column B and divide by column C and do what they're going to do with their math. So you had to fork the JVM to do that? Oh, yeah. There's one, one fork of the JVM on every node in the cluster. They all find each other via a couple of strategies. They all pack us. I was under the impression you just ran a vanilla JVM. I'm sorry, it's a vanilla JVM. Yes. You run a standard JVM. So when you say fork the JVM, you don't mean like software forked the project. You just mean run multiple copies of the JVM. Mo multiple copies. That's correct. It's a, it's so a then how do you get a, a single address space? You don't. You don't. Right. So it gives the illusion of a single address space for 2D array math only. Right. So you have some number of columns of standard data science. There's some number of columns. The columns are name, rank, serial number, age, zip code, number of cars, annual income, 5,000 other columns, whatever the columns are. Count of rows is unlimited. By the by, limited by the size of the memory, size of your cluster. If you write a loop that says for i equals one to n, grab an element out of an array. What you really write is take the uh, a vector column name and say dot at not square brackets of index, but dot at index. The dot at under the hood goes to all the math to figure out that you've got which piece of the stripe you have on your cluster. So that's yeah. the illusion. Your actual for loop really runs from zero to n. It's effectively biased by the base. So what happens when you do time. square bracket? Uh, it's, you're not looking at an array, so it just gives you a syntax error. You're looking at a Java object. Behind those scenes, there is a large byte array that's got the data compressed. It's a columnar compression, so every column's got a different compression strategy. And in fact, there are about 20 strategies and they're broken up. The columns are broken as a distributed. So every little chunk has a different compression strategy. So you say dot at, and it gives you the decompressed version of the value. Generally decompression is done only in registers, takes one to two clocks at tops. Um, and you only run the compressed data through your memory bus hierarchy. And we generally could slam the memory bandwidth limitations of your hardware and uh, do math at much faster than Spark, like 10x faster than Spark, um, and easily 10x faster than pretty much everyone else, um, unless you're doing Blas libraries on a single node. And then we were very competitive with Blas on a single node. That, and then it's Java, and you write for loops, and mathematicians can deal. So mathematicians would come in and write, here's logistic regression, right? Here's generalized linear modeling. Here's, I did gradient boosting machine. Um, here's deep learning variations. We had a bunch of variations of deep learning. Here's whatever. So all your normal min, max, mean, standard deviations you got for the cost of loading the data into the system in the first place, because this is too cheap to go compute. But everything else, you were to for loop somewhere. Sometimes I should, I wonder if I should learn all the math things so I can implement it myself, but I don't know if I should implement it myself. I don't know how much affects language design. So we used Java for the language. The algorithms were written in Java, but like I said, mathematicians can deal. That's not a problem. We did the data path was very cleverly done. It was done in Java, but it could be done in C or Rust. The data path is where all your performance was. That was how you get terabytes of data through your memory bus hierarchy and into the registers to do math. So if it's just like a blob of structs, like, um, like a right. malloc, Oh, um, yeah, I'm just wondering uh, how to get, like, make it everything efficient. Well, you know how much I like efficiencies. I, right. So as you talk about compilation speed, I talk about C2 as an optimized compiler is quite fast for an optimizing compiler, but it's not fast like TCC for generating code, but that's not its plan or its goal. Whereas H2O, the speed is about how do you get the data through the memory bus into the processor, whereas people point out today already and x86 has infinite cycles to go yeah so down. stuff like runtime run length encoding for example levo so if yeah. he had if he had six values and they came in spurts you know he could compress a terabyte of data to you know a couple hundred bytes maybe depending you know depending on how boring it is it turns out that oh i see computers mostly are filled with zeros yeah and randomly you'll find a one in there 
And yeah. so if you're compressing that, it's really, really amazingly fast because you're not streaming data out of memory because it only takes a small number of bits to represent, you know, 6,000 ones in a row uh, versus 12,000 zeros in a row. And then, um, so you're pretending to expand it, but you're not, right? So, so it's, it's less hard. data. Yeah. Yeah. So that's just one example, but he had like 20 different algorithms he was using. Right. So there's, it was a double precision number with no way to compress. You just ate it. It was float. It was integers with narrower ranges. There's base or, and base with an offset. There's things for time where you look, you knew the thing was going to scale upwards as a monotonically raising value with a large base offset because it's milliseconds since the epoch. So you want to subtract the base. You want to take the index in a chunk and scale it so it's kind of the average. And then you have a delta at every point. So you take the index for the you're looking for minus the index for the base of the chunk, add the base for the time zone for the for the nano times or millisecond times, scale uh -huh. that index by your rate that you're flowing through in a chunk, and then add a little delta. And so most of your data is held up in deltas. And the deltas can be so, two bytes. Oh, so, one of my friends uh, knows I like compression. And yeah. so he linked, he linked me to uh, retro game mechanics explained where they explained compression in Pokemon. And uh, some of the things he said just reminded me of it because uh, yeah. one of the things they did was um, they expected um, the sprites to be very similar, but one off. So if it's just one off, uh, it's like part of the compression and it's just- They changed the color based no on- the, they, they changed the color based on, the, on that bit. Well, it was a good so that allows them, it allows them to use the same thing for both the like green background that looks like bushes and something else that is like red or brown or something clouds yeah. or white or clouds yeah 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 totally same same kind of game yeah. this was columnar compression where the usual story for large data sets is within a column things are very similar and you can yeah. compress a lot better so the speed came around from being clever about the data paths and then there was a, 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 a abstraction that got you from the compressed data path to a, effectively a large 2D array, columns by rows. But the rows were distributed across the cluster, and you didn't typically care. And then there was a map reduce effect so that you could roll up things that had to span multiple clusters. And in fact, there was enough chunks of data that were unrelated when the same large vector on a node that you would want to have parallel computation and then the map reduce would let that happen as well. So there's an easy way to write a map reduce. It was a Java pure clean version. It wasn't like a Hadoop map reduce. And uh, you said, you know, make me a new map reduce task, new Mr. Task. And I override map and I override reduce. And the reduce took two Mr. Tasks and gave you back one. And the map took a Mr. Task and gave you back one that had the computation done on it. And you wrote that API, and in your map call, you said for i equals one to n, and you were handed all your columns as argument names, and you said whatever you do in your for loop, and that's what map most of your are. is most of your database or most of the databases or or is most of your data read only? Yeah, so HTO is not a database, so it was a large calculator. So we read data into memory and we computed on it. And we kept a lot of temps and did a lot of things with it, but we didn't write it back out, not as a database would. Because <laughs> last week uh, we were joking around about uh, microservice pointing at the same database and uh, handling mutated states. Uh, I, I knew this last week, but um, microservice tends to actually just have uh, be events div driven designed. So um, you only read the data, you don't mutate it at all. Right. And I guess it's just like streamed in. Um, and I don't know. I just thought it was funny that they actually don't like mutate anything. And it's it's not actually a database. It's just data coming in and then data going out. Yeah. Well, that's a streaming service here. Hey, Heinz. Boy, long time no see. Heinz. Right. Are you, can you hear? I see you move around. Yeah, probably can. So 
that's a good guide for how to break up and move data around, but it yeah. doesn't answer the question. You described AA in one of the yeah. earliest meetings as this is, you are building the language you wish you had when you built yeah. Oh yeah, totally. Yeah. But so far, none of the things you listed are like, oh, here were the places where Java was painful and H2O, I think. Oh, uh, yeah, Java where, where it, yeah. Okay, right. So at, over time- Why Java is AA a better language to build H2O, I guess? Because it way. doesn't support yeah. comments. AA supports comments. What are you talking about, dude? That went in early, early he needs, on. He needs comments. <laughs> He's here to hassle me. It's all good. Um, so I want uh, 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 anonymous functions without all the overhead, which I still can't get out of Java, but it's, it's better now. It's better. Um, actual closures when I want them because they're terribly convenient when you want them and you get closer now in Java, you get thunks in Java. It's easy. You didn't used to, though. When we did H2O, you certainly didn't have any of the, that fun Lambda syntax stuff, the single address method calls, whatever. Also, without all the glorious extra type annotations, you know, Jim Northrup's fond of saying, you know, object, you know, X is equal to new object. Why do I have to say object twice in a row? Um, mm -hmm. So I have a lot of type, uh, type referencing. I have full first class static functions. I have things that I know I can bake down to high performance code everywhere. Um, those were the main goals. Oh, and, so do you and think you'll have to use less unsafe if you are writing in AA than you did in Java? Um, H2O almost used no unsafe for misaligned byte loads only. Um, Non-blocking hash map needed a CAS which you couldn't get, you still can't get without going to unsafe. You can get atomic, which adds a wrapper layer, which costs more than the CAS if you have a high volume count of them. So- You, uh, you can get that now, Cliff. Can you? Yeah. Okay, bar, so that's in, in an element in an array. Yep. Okay. Yes. That was, I used to not be able to do that. That's why I went to unsafe. Yeah, it's like Java 9, I think. As of Java 9, yes. Okay, so unsafe. So, sorry. so 10 years ago. Yeah, uh, non-blocking hash map predates by a fair amount. Fine. So I'm looking for uh, um, some performance high-level, low-level bits, high-level language access to little bits, including CAS and two like arrays. Question. Probably prefetch things. I'm looking for strong static typing. I'm looking for eval. I'm looking for uh, a much briefer, briefer syntax. Um, and I want to have a, a, the ability to do ahead of time. And I want to have the, actually, the, the, one of the other goals is simply to put a, a run. Hey, time Alan, time. Alan, could you mute? Sorry. Oh, other people. I thought you were going to say something in a minute, Alan. I kept waiting for you to perk up. No, he's just, he's got that blue switch keyboard, which sounds so awesome when you're typing, except if you're on Zoom. Uh, <laughs> yeah, fine. Um, yeah, I wanted to make a runtime that included, uh, Optionally, a garbage collector. Optionally, a JIT. Optionally, doing ahead of time compilation. Optionally, capturing profiles that people could use in place of targeting the JVM directly or targeting. Like, there's very few VM choices out there for your own language spec, um, unless you just go straight to the JVM, right? There's a couple. I want. I'm trying to remember. There's there's one of the PyPy variants. One of the Python variants is intended to be. See, uh, I'm a little Python? worried about implementing. Did, did you say R Python? No, I'm, I'm yeah, saying not that one. There, there are VM choices people claim are supposed to be portable VMs that have some web assembly that makes sense. Well, maybe web assembly. It's a web assembly carries a lot of overhead that you cannot dodge, and hmm. so I'm not counting web assembly in this camp. That is to say, I can't generate high efficiency code with WebAssembly because he forces you to code to a particular coding model that you forget all good typing info that you would use to generate good high performance code. Yeah. They claim <clears throat> it'll beat what you can get out of E8. Um, cool. I have yet to see that, and I don't see how without, <laughs> without keeping most the typing around. Most so of the time when you're running WebAssembly, you're running on V8, so that's okay. <laughs> but I thought it was pretty close to instructions, but it was like 32 bit uh, byte aligned or something. Yeah, it's all, it's like a 32 bit byte aligned x86 instruction set. It's kind of weird. 
but it, but it it should be pretty optimizable from what the stuff Cliff's doing. If you don't have the typing information baked in, you can't do a lot of shit that you right. can wait with. Right. It's but that's the same as x86. You would lose all the typing. You know, x86 has one type, which is register. Yes. So I'm not talking about that. I'm saying right. I'm feeding you WebAssembly. You, you're you're as a WebAssembly execution engine, you get fed WebAssembly that has forgotten the Java. Oh, you're type. saying if you're saying your source code was WebAssembly, yeah, uh -huh. then you're then you're screwed. Yeah. Yes, that's what I'm talking about. You got fed. Sorry. You got fed WebAssembly. You already lost it. So I want to get fed something that's got more type information. Right. When I go most of your data. most of your big optimizations happen before you emit your your mid-level or your low-level IR. I, I hear you. Yeah. And what happened in the JVM was all those big optimizations happened with strong type information. Right. Because Which the is why you had to build the lattice. That's why you had to build that lattice stuff in the first place was to figure out the types from the bytecode in hotspot. Well, it, to be fair. I read your paper back then yeah. or whatever it was. Watch yeah, right. the presentation, something. So, so we got still more type information that WebAssembly gets now, which let us do inlining games, class hierarchy analysis, and things like that, that you can't get out of WebAssembly because it's already forgotten things. Because there are no classes. Yeah. Yeah. So why did you want to do VM? I think I missed that. Because I didn't have one. Because a lot of people ask for one because I know how to build one. I thought it would just be simple to jet it because you already know how to do that. But Okay. So part of the, the goodness out of jitting comes from profiles. Where'd you get your profiles from? So profile directed optimizations, I, hotspots full of them because the runtime so, collects profiles. So what Cliff's talking about isn't a VM in terms of what most people use the term for where they mean interpreter. What Cliff is talking about is a stateful library that he can bind to horizontally in and out of at any point in the generated code. I guess I'm uh, talking so, about a VM and not an interpreter. Right, exactly. So it's but the fact is that it's stateful and it has contextual information. And so that combination allows him allows him to collect information that actually means something about oh, I thought this was for porting reasons. Well it would be but not porting C to Java or Java to Fortran. It would be so you can write your favorite language and have a reasonable chance of having a backend that does something besides just emit code. Emitting code is useful, but for instance, you use TCC to emit code, you didn't get a garbage collector. Well, maybe you want a garbage collector, maybe you don't. Maybe you want a Rust style borrow collector. Maybe you want to do the malloc and free things, fine. But you grab TCC, you didn't get a garbage collector straight up. So you know maybe you'd rather have another set of choices there. Uh, where and I asked, LVM is supposed to solve that, but I didn't like the, the API. There you go. It was complicated. Well, no, none of these API is going to be super simple because they do more stuff, but I think there's some, some chance for doing something good here. It was more like I had to jump through hoops to give it information it wanted instead of it being, um, cause the IR is actually very straightforward and the API is not straightforward. It's there's a big mis mismatch. Okay, I can I don't I haven't looked at LLVM, but yeah, but uh, they yeah. offer uh, Jits and uh, other things, and they supposedly offer a garbage collector, but I don't know of any project that uses it. Right. I feel like I hear enough people complaining about LLVM that they must be doing something right. Well, there's not a lot of choices, so so you, you're you know you're gonna pile in one or the other, or you're gonna write your own, or you're gonna give it up. And I think a lot of folks have given up as well. Oh, I cheat! I cheat so much. Go straight to the IR. I mean, to the text IR. It's right. so easy. It's ridiculous. But then you didn't easy get people. the you didn't get the the other pieces you might expect out of a virtual. What I would have expected out of a virtual machine, including safety things and and garbage collection and concurrency things like thread starts and stops and multi-threaded. I'm not even code. sure what the API offers on that's the text IR dozens. Yeah. So one of the things you get out of the hotspot is multi-threaded safety out of the jitted code. The JIT is aware of the Java memory model and honors it in a way that's both efficient and also people can reason about it when they're writing cross-thread code. 
And that's, you know, that's a non-trivial thing that you don't typically get out of a pure, I want to say code generator. Like if I grab GCC or Clang, I don't get that behavior, right? So if I want something there that's multi-threaded safe, I have to start thinking about how I'm generating the code. If I want to have something that's garbage collected safe as well, then I have to put, you know, read and write barriers in the jetted code or have to have... GC points available in the code or GC information available in the code as well. So there's a there's a whole set of strategies involved in the code generation side that depend on whether or not you want to think multi-thread, whether or not you want to think about garbage collection. And then from the optimizer point of view, if you've had high level information and you threw it away, when you got to the optimizer, he couldn't rebuild that. So what Cameron pointed out was I got to rebuild much of generics using this lattice hack thing that I did in C2 for a data analysis. But had I been handed the generic data in the first place, I wouldn't have had to bother to. And it was an imperfect reversing. So I didn't always figure out what the hell the generics were, in which case I punted and did the default thing, which was, you know, you get cast everywhere and profiling covers for some of the sins of failure to, failure to carry the high-level information through. So to Aaron's question, it was some combination of all of the above that led me down the path of I wanted to do something, I wanted to do something with AA that I'm not seeing elsewhere. I want a nicer language to write in. I want a nicer runtime behind it. I want to make it available in a public domain in a way that OpenJDK is very difficult to use. Um, and I'm hearing, I still hear LLVM and the other options seem to be deficient one way or another. So this is part of my goals there. And I think for the AA update, the typing is yeah. stable. I've tidied up a bunch of tech debt the last week and I'm marching forward, getting all my test cases to pass and they're passing one by one, two by two, three by three. All the... I have an update if anyone's yeah, interested. Yeah, fire away. Um, a high level 10 second overview for we have like four new people on this call. Okay, sure. So I am building a compiler, CF Notes compiler that is from scratch. I'm doing it in Clojure. Um, and the reason I'm doing it is that our company has a novel architecture that is not, uh, that has a sort of massive SIMD array for doing AI. Um, that's not supported uh, by any existing compiler. So I just have to sort of figure it out for myself. Um, and so, and it's coming along. I'm actually pretty close to having uh, a, a pretty good working version. Um, I think I've now done everything up to uh, register allocation for the PE array. So, so like inside of our, uh, Inside of our uh, um, chip, we've got this um, this architecture, which is a risk controller controlling uh, a PE array with which has 512 elements, and it has uh, the ability to sort of mask on and off uh, elements in both the sort of row and the column uh, dimension. So it gets a bit complicated in terms of how you, how, uh, what assumptions you can make about that, and and uh, when things are running and and not, and it also is, um, it's very it's designed to be very small, uh, and so it's very functionality limited. So you have to basically translate everything to run in terms of multiply accumulate, uh, or moving moving bytes around. Um, so, yeah, so that's uh, what I'm targeting. And I'm now, I've, I sort of wrestled with this really dumb thing that I did for a couple of months. And then I finally came to my senses and fixed it uh, with uh, uh, like um, to do with sort of state chains. Um, but now I've got sort of my end result that I was aiming for with uh, with good state chains, um, and I haven't had to worry about that for a while. And I'm doing all the other stuff. So in the past, um, uh, uh, so 
No, I should also add that I was, um, I'm compiling from Python syntax as my input. And then I go, go to uh, like an S expression thing and sort of do a few nano pass style passes, uh, bring in dependencies, do all that stuff. And then I go into sea of nodes and optimize. When you're defining work that's happening in the PE array, it looks just the same as, um, you know, it's regular math that you'd be doing in Python. So you're using the addition, multiply, subtract, whatever operators. Uh, and you can have work that's happening in both the risk controller and the PE array, uh, or the PE array, I should say. They, they're very separate worlds. Uh, and I use a type lattice to figure out where the work is actually being being done. And then um, the goal was to have you know addition or multiplication be turned into uh, the specific Mac operations on the PE array sort of transparently. So I've got that working. That's done. And it also has uh, um, you know, you want to minimize moving data around, make things up, make things optimal. And it seems like it's figuring out, um, dependencies and keeping data in the right sort of place. Like it kind of knows that, you know, I've seen a Python uh, tool do something like that. Uh, it's built into Python. It's just the AST library. So, uh, it oh, produces cool. this really ugly, um, AST, and then they've got this whole visitor pattern library. Um, but uh, what I did is, uh, I really hate doing stuff with visitor pattern. Uh, so I, I, I just uh, took their, they have this like generic visitor, which will visit everything. And I just took that and I emitted a giant data structure um, of like kind of S expression like with like their the class name and every attribute as a sort of map. So it's like a class name map of everything that's in the class and then an array of everything that's a child of it. And, uh, and that is a way simpler data structure to work with. And I did that in about eight lines of Python and then everything else I was able to do in closure. So, um, sure. yeah, so that's, uh, so anyway, so I'm, I'm super happy about about this. Um, so I could show a couple of things. Like I can show how um, uh, operations look in the graph at the point that they're um, transformed from uh, like uh, from like regular like operations to like Mac. Good to go. Um, yeah, pretty much. Actually, the thing that I had up, though, which is totally good to go, I could do first, is I was trying to deal with the SSA swap issue. So, and I think I've got it as a simple single rule in the grow phase of my ideal phase. Okay. I, I, I never, in the SSA form, there's no swap. You just point to the other guy. Yeah, but so when you come out of SSA, then you can have the like clobbering. No, no. So I, I had this like, uh, well, basically, I'll sh I can show. I claim sharing's on, by the way. And then Stefan, okay, did you have yeah, something yeah. you to say? Uh, I'll come around to you in unless it's right here. Uh, no, sure. But I, I just want to ask, why do you get out of SSA? But okay, sure. Uh, yeah, so the reason that I get out of SSA is that I wrote my register allocator before I wrote my sea of nodes thing, and I don't want to rewrite it right now. So I'm going to instead try and go out of SSA form. So, uh, yeah, so this. Ah, go. Okay, now you're making more sense. So when I come out of SSA, it's with the register allocator. You want to come out <laughs> to the register allocator. So, yes, you can yeah. just sort it out. Yeah, here. yeah, yeah. So. Um, it's not a swap, by the way. It's a generic cycle. You can have yeah, it's, it's a, okay. Yeah. It's an arbitrary cycle. Yeah. And you so, just have to throw in a, a temp to break one temp to break the cycle. Yeah. So I couldn't figure out how to throw in just one. I had to throw in two. And I, okay. I so I've I think I've got it working and I can show the 
graph here. Um, so this will be um, every cycle needs a minimum of one. <laughs> But if you throw extras in, there's no harm, and the register yeah. allocator that follows should be able to clean up all your extra moves. That's the whole yeah, point. it should be able to. That's what I was thinking. So I was thinking that maybe that that's just easier. Um, uh, so if so, basically right here is where I've got the cycle, and so I've got you know data coming in, sort of arbitrary something. Um, right. To work on your presentation to be because we don't know how to read your IR. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'll um so this is a fee node and here's another one. Yeah. And I call them compose with select. They look a bit more like fees now because I've stuck the select inside yeah. and it's a yeah. lot less confusing. Yeah. Um so I've got two variables coming in. Actually, let me the, the, the classic case you get hit with this is running, I want to say um fast version of Fibonacci continuously rotates who's in what register and you have to split a like if you're looking for an example to break you uh -huh. write, write Fibonacci okay and what do you use to plot these uh graphs this is a, a library called d2 it's uh, it's this one D2, okay. D2 it's layout. Right, but if you were doing the layout by hand. So the layout, no. yeah, and the doc. Where'd the doc? So I, I have a, a little thing. It's about 50 lines of code because I've gotten really elaborate and to generate the any sort of arbitrary graph. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it was pretty easy to generate and it just works. It takes a minute to. It takes a bit of time to compile. It takes a long time if the graph gets too big, but for small graphs, it's really fast. Um, yeah, so here's here's the program that, that I'm running. So basically I've got two values, A and B, and I I basically just have this uh, oh, yeah. assign a temp, set A to B, set B to the temp, yeah. and I'm going around the loop five times. And then in the end, I'm adding them together. So the idea is just to, swap a few times and then I need to be able to have right. both A and B. So mm -hmm. this works. So I, it's not really, you know, I, I think I'm, I think I've got the general case covered, but I'm not entirely sure. So I guess I'll see, but yeah. So you're saying fast Fibonacci. I'll have to look that up. Uh, just the standard Fibonacci where you, instead of calling yourself recursively twice, you just keep the first and second terms. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay, I'll uh, one, keep rotating, I'll... and it's well understood, yeah. and you know how the code machine code should look like, and it has an obvious answer what it should be, and it forces a, the register allocator to break an SSA cycle, and uh, and put a copy in. Okay, yeah. That was so that's I, that one. And... Go to test case for, yeah, for breaking or whatever for testing that, and then the same flavor of thing done with multiple values for the fib can get you multiple copies that you had to break or longer loops than two elements you had to break a cycle on or you can get multiple cycles that had to be broken on the same point or whatever there's variations on that thing you need a yeah. parallel copy and then have the allocator clean it up mostly yeah okay so uh so i just generated another graph here and i'll maybe zoom that in in a second but uh this one's still a failing test because I've got a couple of minor things to deal with on it, but mostly it's correct. Uh, so this one is actually a Python program. Uh, and so what this one's doing is, um, so this is basically on our architecture, we have to do byte operations for any, any math. So you do like, byte times byte, and then you get a four byte result. Uh, and it's four bytes because the multiply accumulate and it keep, holds the result in the accumulator and you can keep on accumulating in for, you can do quite a few multiplies before you run out of bytes, run out of bits. Um, and, uh, but it's painful and annoying if you have to um, do 16 bit multiplies or 32 bit multiplies, cause you have to like take all the bytes and and uh, uh, sort of 
organize it all. So I, one of the nice things about this uh, approach is that I've got this ability to do standard libraries or libraries in general. And so, you know, one of the sort of early demos that I was able to do is like, um, you know, sit thir multiply 32 bit values. And so that's what this graph shows. And so basically, if I, hmm. if, uh, let's see here. Yeah. So this, I'm calling this function here. Hmm. And I have to basically do all of the byte multiplies. Now, one of the things you'll notice is that I've implemented multiple return. And of all the decisions that I made, this was the best decision. The multiple return thing is so good. Um, okay. It, it, it allows me to deal with uh, all sorts of things like uh, some effectful operations have multiple um, things change. And so I just treat it as a multiple return, just use projections for this. And, okay. and so I can do these functions where instead of returning the, like having to sort of reassemble all my resulting bytes back into a single value, which, you know, I'm, my maximum value size is 32 bits. So then I would have to start putting things in memory or something. I can just return six one byte values. And then the optimizer really likes it. So once this all is inlined, then I can so I end up dead code eliminating all the work that doesn't actually need to be need to happen. So in this example, I'm you know I'm doing all sixteen multiplies plus a bunch of adding carries together and stuff. And uh, but I'm actually only looking at two bytes of the result. Uh, so this this syntax is compose a two bit value for um bytes. so that's what i'm using the tuple uh in yeah. in python for uh, uh um so it just saves me from having to sort of set index a bunch of times um so i can so but basically i've got this and and uh now you'll notice that i've got three different copies of of this they're actually identical uh, i just don't have the ability to inline if a function is called more than once <laughs> yet. Ah, <laughs> so, gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, gotcha. you know, copy and paste to the rescue. Uh -huh. um, and so, you know, I, uh, a simple multiply byte times D word, I basically have a byte. I multiply by the first byte. I'm then I multiply by the next byte, then by the next byte, then by the next byte, yeah. and add in the carries. And so yeah. I end up with five bytes of results. And it, you don't need to like follow it. It just gives you a sense of what it's doing. Right. And this one's doing the same, but I've got some extra arguments for additional carry information that's coming in. Right. And this is all the fed into the PE unit. Yeah, exactly. So this all happens on the PE, right? So doing this in assembly is hard because it's a lot of operations. And right. yeah. um, like each one of these statements becomes a bunch of moving things around. But once it's compiled i end up um with yeah. these sort of get index i've got the type do the multiply accumulate it produces the the type this is constant so everything stays constant um eventually i may have it uh just turn that into a constant in which case this thing will just return the final result um but i'm sort of able to slice a byte out, do the multiply, it sticks it into the right register. When I've got something like this, a Mac, and then the D is fed directly in, then I don't need to move the result around from this. And so, uh, so this basically is the D register input for this uh, Mac operation. Um, what I'm multiplying it by, so sometimes you're just adding. So this is uh, multiply by one, right? So that's how you add. When all you have is multiply accumulate, <laughs> uh, multiply by negative one is subtract, and uh, right. So you put the the result into the D register. You multiply by one or negative one, the other thing, and you can add bytes in. Uh, and yeah, so it ends up being elaborate. But hey, in the end, 
that is my correct result. I've double checked and I've got a, a D word. You, you constantly folded it down to the correct result. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So yeah. if I, you know, if I did, I eventually I will put the constant folding in, but I like to put it in later because it's a lot easier to check things with constants. And if it gets, gets right. constant folded, then it's really annoying. Gets all goes away. Yeah. So I I'm really happy. I'm yeah. like basically mission accomplished with uh, one of my biggest goals. And now I just have to, hopefully I can register allocate this. Okay. But I think there's, I think it's all doable. Yeah. That's where I'm at. Yeah. Cool. All right. I'm going to, I'm going to call Stefan up here if he wants to. Yeah, sure. Uh, so before you were talking about, um, Java jitting and yeah. uh, your your uh, like virtual machine or whatever. And I just I wonder what is uh, what is it that is the big benefit of jitting over uh, statically compiling? I mean, if you know that some loop is hot, for example, like what can you do that you wouldn't be able to do otherwise? So there are a couple <clears throat> things that happen there. That, that... Functionally, the big one is you can add code and it runs just as fast as if you had it ahead of time to be compiled. So that's not answering your question about what you do during the JIT, it, other than, in fact, you didn't have the code. Now you got the code while the program's running. It's just as fast mm -hmm. as, as if you'd had the code in the first place. So that's a big deal for a lot of folks. That means every server on the planet can pick up code on the fly and it's as if they had the same code all along. Uh, and answer your question directly there, you get profiles. So mm -hmm. you said, if you know a loop is hot, how do you know it's hot? Oh, somebody said four I equals one to N. How big is N? Well, the average loop trip count, you know, back when I was a kid growing up in compiler school was 10. That was considered a reasonable metric. But when I go profile Java code, I find tons of loops where the trip counts zero or one. And there may not be the inner or outer loops. It can be inner loops where the trip counts zero or inner loop where the trip counts one. And the outer loop is actually the hot one and you need to reverse the loops to get the performance. Mm. So you grab you grab the, the actual real profile data that you got just from the prior JIT round or from the interpreter. I've actually been thinking about, I'm not sure I will ever do this, but it would be kind of cool to record uh, someone using the, the program and then use that to statically compile. And, that's and uh, I mean, obviously that's really brittle because then when you change a line, it, it doesn't map anymore, but you could actually hook the syscalls so that it could reproduce that thing. Cause it's gonna compile anyways, it's gonna take some time. So, so that, that would the, be great. The next thing is that jitting does not have to be slow. If you've grabbed yeah, yeah, sure. VM, you may have this certain view Obviously, if you're a Levo and you grab TCC, you have a different view of how fast or how slow jitting can be. I um, assume that I can go a lot faster if I go jits or emits the bytecode directory directly. Yeah. I never so, assumed it was slow. If you want to have more optimization, you run a little slower, but you can still be quite fast doing like, like C2 gets out something close to GCC-02 at 100 times faster than GCC puts out dash 02 code. So you can go pretty fast with the jetting. So that's that's a separate issue. It's not fair comparing to GCC though, because it's so bad. Archer, what were no, you gonna uh, say? <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say that to, to generalize that profile point about JIT compilers, uh, in general, they can specialize for the very situation they are in. Like they can specialize for the profile, they can specialize for like class hierarchy, they can specialize like for values of your fields, for example, and uh, compile code specifically for that situation. And like, if you have a sophisticated enough runtime, you can have mechanisms to roll back and like recompile. So this adaptiveness for the specific situation, that's what gives you extra performance that you, like it's hard to achieve with static compilation. So somebody says- I, I In short, that, in short, it, it will make your shitty code go fast. It will make your <laughs> shitty code go faster. Somebody yeah. pulls in com.apache.commons.blah-blah-blah-blah-blah and a billion bytecodes show up. Turns out that 99% will never ever execute, so don't bother compiling them. Of the ones that execute, the first thing you say, if library flag X is set, use this library, use Jackson versus JSON. 
And that's a profile bit that says, I'll never run GSON, I'll only ever run Jackson or whatever the hell it's going to be. So there's a lot of high level bits that say, do I never went down this path? Then somebody comes along and says, I have a virtual call to convert this thing to JSON, this Java object wad to JSON. Well, it turns out that because of that high level flag being set, that virtual call only ever goes to the Jackson side or only ever goes to the JSON side. And so mm -hmm. you can statically compile it, despite the fact it's looking at a runtime flag whose value is set at runtime. In practice, it means it's a constant for the compiler's point of view and your virtual call mm -hmm. became a static call. And now you inline the Dickens out of it. Or oh, maybe okay. duplicate the code for, for two dominant. All the usual sure. optimizations then kick in once you've decided that you have a constant call. Class but, hierarchy analysis. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, but problem. you could still do this with uh, if you did stats on a compiled thing. If you compiled with stats, you could do the same things. I mean, for example, let's take a game, right? Yeah, right. And you you know that you want the loading to go fast and you want something else to go fast. Right. You, you could go open your game, like click record, open your game, go there, make sure you spend a lot of time with the slow parts or the things you want to optimize for and then stop your recording and then produce some kind of output stats file and then use that to compile. But I don't know. I don't know yeah. why people do this. this. Is as, how, Yorick, as Yorick pointed out, yeah, this Yorick, is profile yeah. guided optimization. When I was a young guy, that was the term in use. And people had a mode they would compile, a compile flag they would put on, they would compile your application. When you ran the application, it would collect profiles until you called a magic library that would dump them. So in your case, okay. you would load your game up under this mode, play the game a while, however you wanted to play it, and then hit the dump button, hit the exit, and it would dump. Now you have profiles. Now go go you know run the code again or, or jit the code again, compile with those profiles. What what happened? Why don't people do this anymore? Or do they? Because it's a pain in the butt. You had to do two, you had to do two different steps. Also, because it wasn't the default mode of operation, these paths were always buggy. There were compiler bugs in there all over the place because hmm. the, the yeah, so I tried I tried a profile guided optimization on my compiler. And it got slower. So the vendors all optimized Typical. for the case that people used, except mm. for the benchmarks they were selling their compiler on. Those they did, the profile guided optimizations, and got them all working correctly. But if a generic customer ran their generic code with profile guided optimizations, God help them. So mm. okay. no one ever did, and those bugs never got out. Yeah, I think now, it's Java just operational complexity. With profile guided optimization. And it only ever runs with the, you know, the same level of optimization, the O2 version of things. So all the bugs got, uh, you know, cleaned out of it. But theoretically, the shouldn't, it, sh shouldn't it be simpler than a JIT to do? I mean. Um, not terribly. With the JIT, you have the profiles in memory. With hmm. the other version, you generate codes to collect profiles you have to write them out when you read them in you have to also then read the source code and do this one-to-one -one mapping between the profile data you read it from a disk file with the code mm. you just read in and if those get out of sync you can get all these weird little subtle bugs where you didn't realize what synchronization had to be kept in place you do it on the fly sure. those never get out of sync and hang on a second. i think arthur's trying to say something yeah, I would also add that uh, this trade-off or like how much you gain with dynamic compilation depends on your language. And uh, the more dynamic features you have in the language, the more you would benefit from specialization from this specific state. Like if you are compiling C or C++, probably like, yeah, you will gain from the profile, but I don't think the gains will be that much. But if you are compiling something like JavaScript, if you compile it ahead of time without specializing for, for a specific situation, yeah, your performance would suck. And Java is somewhat in the middle. It has enough of dynamic capabilities like class loading, like lazy initialization, all that stuff that uh, it can hurt performance if you are not doing something about it. So back in the day, I got 10% out of the C's profile guided optimization on the benchmarks of the era. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and I think in Java for us, if we disable, um, if yeah, if we disable profile guided optimizations, it's about twenty to thirty percent of performance. Yeah, we've got to say be a lot more. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I bet you. The other, other trade off is this question of how important is throughput versus how important is consistency. 
So I worked on a project where the largest customer was much larger than the second largest customer. So we ended up essentially splitting the workload into two servers, largest customer, entire rest of the customer base. Okay. And the largest customer paid a lot of attention to making sure their queries were fast and not using the slow parts. And the JIT was very good at essentially compiling out all of the stuff that they never called because they never called it because it was slow anyway. And the other one had <laughs> compiled everything in and that worked. And oh, that's awesome. very different behavior profiles from the one really large customer that optimized their queries and everyone else who never thought for more than three seconds about what their queries were going to do to the system. This cool. is a very different approach than someone who's say writing a game where you're like, I am trying to hit 60 frames a second. And if I hit 58 frames a second, some of the time, but I'm getting 65 frames a second on average, that doesn't actually help me. I would much rather have something that I really have consistency in how it's compiled. And it's not like, oh, I just picked up a new kind of armor that I'd never used before. So I had to recompile half of the game because I picked up a new kind of armor and suddenly I'm dropping frames after I pick I, up the new. You know, you said 58 frames a second and I'm an old, old, old school gamer. I'm like, what the hell's wrong with 58? I'm used to it fucking good under one. <laughs> Slideshow mode. Ah, play the game You can go play your Mario at your 16 frames a second. Gamers complain so much today, like you can't get away with. So like they talked about that with SQLite, that yeah. they had a bunch of people who were doing profile guided optimizations and you can let it watch what queries you're doing and will collect stats about the queries. And eventually they realized this had to be off by default. So SQLite now doesn't actually recalculate its query plans until you explicitly say, hey, you look at the data in the database and recalculate your query plan because there were a bunch of customers who were like, we can't have jitter in how this behaves when it's in the flight control system for a plane. What's like, SQLite doing in a plane? That's interesting. Oh yeah, Boeing's got SQLite all over the plane. Oh geez. Oh my God. Oh, so if you're in a game, maybe you want to compile everything in very static ways that are going to give you sure. very predictable worst case times. Whereas if you're some commercial, I'm just trying to churn through the backlog as fast as I can, having a JIT that sometimes I get lucky and sometimes I get unlucky, but on average I do better. You're I'm not 100% sure, but I think the planes just use SQL for the logging. I'm not 100% sure though. Planes collect a lot of statistics. Yeah, I actually heard- really get it. it could be out of the flight path of the, the life critical flight I path. think it is still using it SQL SQL light has yeah, I doubt it's in the like fly by years. wire code but, but to be honest I mean there's only one metric that is really relevant isn't it is it did it crash or did it not <laughs> are you talking about SQL light or the plane uh, I'm gonna let you gather those data yes. points yeah. let me know when there. you quit gathering because I can then mark you as didn't make it <laughs> <laughs> yeah. there's an interview with the SQL light guy though he he seems really good there's uh almost no bugs anymore he went through like they have a automotive standard almost. or something like that where they go My through plane all... has almost no bugs almost. On it. <laughs> like for 10 years they have one bug and the only code they've done for like 10 years is tests hmm. so but anyway yeah whatever I, but I'm knowing that I've but knowing that things. would you still would you still frequently jump on a plane that almost has and has no, Almost has no bugs well, just don't fly over the mean, equator at midnight and the plane won't fly upside down well, what's, yeah what's the alternative but, though like uh, but now it makes sense that people are going forward and and move to DuckDB because sqlite doesn't have any bucks anymore right hmm. I, hmm. there is a tendency for people just to the new the shiny thing that's I'm not doing any dbs that's that's hmm. not my game plan <laughs> I'm reasonably confident that I've bet my life on SQLite at some point. I just don't know when that was. Right. Mm. Yeah, fine. And you live, so mm, it wasn't immediately fatal. And so isn't SQLite a baby. by multiple orders of magnitude the most used database? Yes. Isn't it for one oh, thing sure. It depends if browser. you count gzip as a database. <laughs> 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 yeah, file systems are the most used. And then the second would be... SQLite, maybe I don't know. Yeah. 
I think I heard that Zlib was the most used uh, library, and then SQLite was. Uh, I don't know if it was the second, oh, but I imagine the ping would be. But yeah. I guess uh, uh, Zlib has. Uh... Go ahead, Sam. I think uh, uh, CLIP is uh, on pretty much every system, but usually or often just once because in many times it's it's dynamically linked. But I think for uh, SQLite, many people prefer statically linking it. So it might be that on every system you have uh, CLIP and you have SQLite, but you have five times SQLite but so how, and how not many just bytes? once of the Amazon data center are, are holding SQLite at any point in time. Memory bytes, not that, not this, right? But it's just a file protocol. It's I think a, it's got to be considered big data. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. Did anyone here ever hit a limit where they couldn't fit the amount of data they wanted in a SQLite database? We never actually hit the scaling problems in SQLite database. database, only the spindle really? speed of I can't get data on and off a hard drive fast enough. Uh, I thought we were just I, talking about the bytes of SQLite library. I, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, I, I'm I pretty sure I compiled Amazon like one and a half megs for the library. Yeah, but and how many I, times does it appear on any given Amazon server instance? One and a half megs times many millions. Yeah, exactly. But fine. And that's only here, the there, kicks. Sure we're talking real memory. No. <laughs> All right, something new, or we we'll call it lunchtime. Uh, I, I was uh, curious earlier about. Um, actually, um, let me just think of my question first. It's okay. But again, people do these stats of like, what are the most used compilers? But if SQLite's in everything, it's also one of the most used compilers. Oh, that's interesting. I, I would have said it was C2 for many like, years. It's clearly not calling out to LLVM to turn those SQL statements into assembly. Yeah, so the difference here is that uh, C2 ran on every JVM, which was had billions of running instances all the time until you know V8 came along. And then now it's on every web server on the planet, which probably beats C2 by a fair amount. But uh, so my question was about uh, unsafe. Uh, we were talking about that earlier, and uh, I was just like wondering, um, how do you include unsafe without it causing so much uh, chaos? And did C code uh, badly uh, damage like Java or like? Because I, I don't know anyone that uses uh, like C code with their Java. Okay, so the JVM calls out the C code all over the place. That's all the native wrappers. You know, Java doesn't have. Uh, I thought this was like unsafe. Like the user calls the C code. No. Okay. So no. So, so it's a separate. Uh, I I think a level uh, has uh, means some misc unsafe. Th th yes, there's a couple things there, right? If I say unsafe in the, in a sort of Java context, I'm usually talking about sun dot misc dot unsafe, which is a series of library calls that the JIT recognizes and specifically inserts direct code for uh, without going through Java bytecodes. So the usual one would be basically, you know, basics peek and poke. Read at this address, write at this address. Do anything you want with it. You can cheat your heart's content. Um, it was the only way to get CAS for a long time. Uh, it's the only way to get alternative read and write barriers other than what you got in the locks for a long time. Um, now there's a bunch of other things you can get that are safer in the Java context and, and better at it. Um, there are a couple other things I can't remember. You can malloc and free and shit like that. Then if you, uh, uh, then there's FFI, foreign function interface, for which Java calls anything that can be linked against the JVM proper. It has to be linked. It can be dynamically linked on the fly, fine. Um, that does a lot of uh, careful dancing about to try and prevent the FFI from breaking the JVM, but it, it, FFI becomes part of your trusted computing base. So you can totally break yourself. So like, we don't hand you pointers directly, Java pointers, because we're gonna move them. And the C code doesn't understand moving pointers. So we hand you a handle instead. And the handle always works and you pay an indirection cost if you're C code doing FFI. And the C code can block and it can mal, it can free, and then it can do breaking things all the time as well. It can, you have to call it to call threads. Yeah, I'm watching people plow through on the 
on the chat. There's a bunch of things that FFI have. So, but those DFFI handles are not known to be the easiest thing to code to without breaking things. Right. Yeah. That's because they move on you on uh, from under you. And for a long time, we we supported them. They're just handed out for free, and then people broke. Then they were handed out with a pinning API, which is a pain in the neck on both the user and the GC side, because the GCs, like a lot of them, put the pinning, put hard effort in the inner loops of GC. So all GC cycles slowed down to support pinning. And the other guys, they couldn't reliably manage their lifetimes. So they couldn't unpin. They said they were done and they would unpin, but they weren't. And then the GC moved it and they broke and it was a bad API for everybody. So now it's just handles and suck it up buttercup. And the GC, you know, does a good job and you have to deal on your side with the contents of that handle moving from time to time. So I think I should try to avoid supporting, uh, calling out to C code as long as possible. I'm going to eventually have to do it, but yeah, right. You, you would have called yeah. print, print F console input, console output. Well, I support that in my own library. Okay. Okay. Every one of those now multiply by every syscall on the planet, right? That's, that's the game. So, and worse when you want to draw pixels to the screen. Yeah. I was thinking about that earlier this week. You want to call out to Vulcan? Like, yeah, maybe you can do all that as intrinsics, but. Right. Fine. So See, I one of the, one of the things I was thinking about my language is instead of supporting C, I could just um, export my everything as a C function. So when you break, you're breaking in your own C code and it looks my, it makes my language looks better, but I'm not hundred percent sure that's the way to go. Every it might time, actually be useful. Every time you're a new language, you're trying to get somebody to use something. Transparency is the only answer. You will have bugs. The other guy will have bugs. You'll have bugs that only show up in the cross product between the two. If you're not understandable, you're not transparent enough. No one will be able to figure it out. And then it's not usable because I can't figure this bug out. Uh, so if you guys have a C library, would you prefer to call other libraries from your C or would you prefer to call C from the other like technologies? I'm assuming that I'm not going to end up either on, on top or on bottom, that I'm in the middle of the sandwich layer cake. Oh. And that's a little harder position to be in, but that's the, all the, I mean, that's how you get adoption that you can be used. I can be handed callbacks that call back to your language. You can call me and then I'll, I'll claim something about, you know, Aaron, you're asking questions. I think my typing system will let me track shit like what's in my trusted computing base. And that means if you hand me something that's outside my trusted computing base, but you called me, then it's in yours. It's like same with Cameron does all the time as well. There is a thing I mean, there. If you're calling back and forth, dueling GCs can become really complicated. At Twitter, the Spaces team had a bunch of logic that was split between web, um, what's the little browser thing that's in the middle? Not, not the actual embedded web browser, but like a web widget thing and okay. the JVM. Yeah. And they yeah. were constantly handing objects back and forth between JavaScript and Java and when can those things be freed? Yeah. So like, there's there was well, about six weeks there where 90% of the times when the Twitter app crashed, it was because they had handed pointers back and forth between the web intents yeah. and the JVM and somebody freed something when they weren't supposed to. Right. So, so that distributed GC issue was academically studied 20 and 30 years ago. No one's put it into practice except periodically. Apparently Twitter's an example. Um, in theory, it's well understood. In practice, it's a pain in the neck. So I'll, I'll probably hand you a version of AA that you say, I don't want to do any allocation and I'll force you to not do any GCing allocation. And then you can be embedded inside in somebody else's GC and it's fine. Yeah, that's the other question is, can you do a custom allocator where you say, okay, everyone on one side of the line, literally every time you allocate, yeah. you have to call into the other side and ask it for memory. Yeah, yeah. And, and that'll be, you're handed a, an allocator thunk thing. And then you pass it along and then wherever somebody says, oh, I need a foo object. They, they use the thunk and they get a foo object. Uh, funny know. enough, I actually do that. If, I, I'm, if I'm looking against C, it will just use a C allocator. 
but uh, my memory manager still uh, does the allocation in my language. Like, there's no malloc uh, that you can do from uh, my language. But at that point, if I call free in the language, what I'm doing is passing the free to the other side. If you're handed you a thought, can't free. You can't free at all, and you can't malloc at all. You just say you want to use memory or you want an object, and it just does it for you, and it tracks where it should uh, free. So when the memory manager frees, uh, it, basically you better hope that your uh, the signatures uh, calling to uh, C is like correct, and that they're not holding on to the memory because there's no way to say um, like this might like if you say I'm giving the memory to C, you better hope that um, like you got the right signature because there's no way to know if um, yeah. there's no logic. To make sure C won't honor, your C code and your yeah. code is consistent. Right. C won't honor your constraints on memory management. Yeah, That's it doesn't what, signal uh, yeah. certain things, but yeah. yeah. The, the Java solution, the JVM solution was we don't hand you a pointer, we wrap it, hand you a handle. Right. So, so I'm just saying there is a problem here, and different people go different solutions. The but, Twitter guy said, we, we hand it back and forth and we manage internally ourselves without language support and we screw it up from time to time and we crash because we screw it up. Yeah. Without a moving GC, can a fragmentation of memory become a problem? Right? Yeah, always. If mm -hmm. you don't have, yes, without a moving collector, you can always have fragmentation death. But this and whole conversation kind of sounds like we need a new... Of of, of how to go break all these collectors. He wrote on purpose a Java program, ran on a background thread and fragmented your heap to hell and gone. Have you guys uh, read that article? Didn't use much memory, but this? forced giant fragmentation and every garbage collector on the planet would just roll over and barf and die. But it sounds like we need a new FFI abstraction where fundamentally when you're handing objects from one language to another language, that yeah. You make the distinction between I'm giving you versus I'm borrowing. Uh, I'm loaning you or borrowing. Yeah, I mean, right. that makes it, me but, seem like, yeah. yeah, we need to play the borrow checker game between all of the But language. the problem so, is, so, is you will have to bridge functionality between what you're passing. You so have to agree. Hmm. So you hand this off to the C code. He doesn't understand. He doesn't know how he's going to do. He frees your pointer behind your back. You just borrowed it. You need it back. You freed it or whatever, right? You can't stop him. And it's not uh, his and, language guarantee. Another yep. issue is um, if the if you're giving away the memory, they have to know what kind of uh, malloc or memory manager you used. Yeah, if you're running different memory managers, you have to hand the memory manager to go with that free. Yes, yes. And you also have to make sure that you understand the object header and, and stuff like that. Right. The that's, C guy, that's, that's if I hand the Java object to C and he frees it, he doesn't know I have a Java object header and he might free it ahead of the head. Like I, I, I bias the offset to give him a C looking thing without the Java object header. Then he frees at the biased offset. He's like, oh, geez. <laughs> <laughs> this is an article called- Your solution uh, is never give, only borrow. Whoever no, allocated the no. object is my, the only one who can free it. My solution is if you cross to C, which is a language that does not understand this concept, you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. And you're in trouble up to what the C does. If C is honorable, if you have carefully handcrafted JNI code, which the JVM does, okay, which you can have for all your languages, you're okay. If you want to hand a generic junk C code that some other guy wrote, you're not okay. Whereas if you switch to calling Rust from Levos or AA, we can arrange that the borrow concept passes across the wire correctly. That was my point to bridge functionality between what you're passing. Yeah, it has to be on the other it. side. And if it doesn't have it, it doesn't have it. It, it has to be so, some yeah. agreement. What 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 should we do? Yes. So um, the same, same question goes with thread local safety. I have an object that I'm going to continuously bump stats on, and I'm handing it off from AA to Java. If I do the Java memory model, we can have an agreement. If I hand it over to Russ or hand it over to Pony Lang or hand it over to C, I have different expectations of what it means to have a mutable memory state. And the other guy will or will not honor, you know, my language model memory state. Right, which is basically what Jane I does, giving you wrappers for Java types. And I mean, you can still get a raw pointer, but um, as you said, for, for nicely crafted Jane I code, that's not a problem. There are some of these links in the chat, I mean, into the docs for other people to read later. 
Flu, GitHub, oh. Hammers versus Pointos, yes. Yeah, I'm not used to the Google Docs and I don't have that page open. Oh, just click the link and it'll open up in your browser. And then in the browser, it's like a web page, except you can type an edit in it in parallel with everyone else typing that. It's pretty slick. Google Google done a good job there. And the I link's now in the chat. Wave, but Google Talks kind of became that in, in the end. Became what? Well, remember, I don't know if anyone remembers this Google Wave, but it was basically oh. their first prototype of live it editing. Quite literally Google became Docs. that. Google Docs is based on the operational wave operational transform code that was written for Google Wave. Nice. Yeah, okay. Okay. Fine. Yeah. Yeah, I remember using things that predated Google Docs for shared whiteboards and they were all flakier in hell. And and Google Docs seem to have done a pretty good job here. Yeah. Actually, I have one more question uh, that might be interesting to bring up. Uh, more interesting than your to... favorite CRDP? What's that? Never mind. Keep going. Some, some punished joke. <laughs> Sorry. Carry on. Um, here, let me pull, let me share a screen here one more time. Should should be okay. Yeah. Oh, I've I wanted to mention that uh, there's some Python uh, tool. It it okay, save, I, save it until it just, Derek until Derek right. gets his thing. Okay. So let me just make this a bit smaller. It should be better. Um. So this is. Um, this is some old tests that I'm, so I'm just at the point where I'm doing instruction selection and getting into register allocation. So this is uh, select the output of selecting uh, instructions for like basically a call operation. Mm -hmm. Basically doing a call and assign the result to, to G, uh, mm -hmm. variable G. And so it generates all of these instructions. Um, and I think that's, oh, I think it's correct. I had this working before and all that. I need to update it. But um, my question is, I've been debating whether I should generate these as nodes in the graph and generate sort oh. of low level stuff like this in the graph um, and then apply the instruction scheduler to that stuff. Well, like, wait a second. Or if I should just generate it like this, where it's all sort of one block of sequential yeah, instructions. Right. Yeah. So what are you going to do for your register allocation? This, this well, is so this is this would be the input to the register allocator. So these V yeah. whatever would become right. registers, okay. and these GR things are already registers. Okay. So in the land of of C two, the register allocator will want those to all be separate instructions, but he's going to carefully arrange that the, the virtual register and the physical register get aligned, and then he'll throw the move away. And when he can't do that, he might still shuffle that move around for performance reasons or scheduling, or he'll shuffle it around because if he can shuffle it, he can change the count of registers you need to have in temporary flip-floppy storage and registers, and then you get a register back. So, so separate instructions yeah yeah so do it uh, put them into the rep uh yeah, generate so, these into the graph like right before scheduling and then no. I'll maybe get some um I'll, I'll probably get some value numbering out of it and yeah things happen and, so, so again there's a there's a different model here and i don't know if it makes sense to go halves in on the c2 allocation model the C2 allocation model would have you do something very different. And maybe, and you know, I don't know, maybe it didn't make any sense. Um, what do you mean? So the C2 model has every, every uh, instruction have a set of registers for every input and every output that are allowed. It has a bit vector set for every set of registers. It's just a 64-bit word of allowed registers. Calls immediately bind all their registers to the calling convention, registers. It makes total sense. Okay, first round of coloring, if two things have unrelated register sets that are allowed, the, the cross product or the, the, the intersection of their inputs and their output register sets don't collide, they don't get an edge in the interference graph. So it's a graph coloring allocator. You don't get an edge in the interference graph. If you if you agree that like your AS second op up there, GR op, GR move V to A is general register nine. Okay, if 
somebody else is in general register two, because that's the return register, and he needs to go to none, and they don't overlap, I don't put an edge in the interference graph. So the first round interference graph is usually smaller. This is an n squared problem. It does change the asymptotic running time of the compiler. So having a smaller interference graph goes directly to compilation speed, which, like I said, you know, maybe that makes sense. And the uh, on small methods, I frequently just color in one pass, and I'm done. Okay, yeah. if that fails during the next round of splitting, not spilling, the splitter splits live ranges that have no registers in common with a generic move op that has both inputs and outputs being everything and also can target memory as a move target or a split target. And if it ends up targeting a memory op, you have an infinite number of virtual registers in memory and it's a loader store, it's a standard spill op, or it's a reg reg move, or the you know coloring makes them tie up at a later time because somebody else moved and then you get the right color and it goes away. So I don't put any of those in, in the C2 version of things. I do instruction selection. I do instruction scheduling. I go to the allocator with none of those moves in place. The allocator makes a first pass. Small methods might go. Big methods almost never will. He'll then split everyone who can't be made to go and try again. Now, again, if you're medium small, you might go. But if you're larger, you surely need real spills. And he starts splitting live ranges according to other rules, you know, hot code and large, long live ranges and use of loop. Well, he has other spill heuristics. He splits yeah. them. But when you're done with rounds of splitting and coalescing and splitting and coalescing, the actual placement of those move ops is up to the allocator to get you a minimum count of reg spills. So they, they're not instructions like so it's free to move a move op in the schedule. You don't fucking care. Right, so so your allocator is actually moving move ops around as well, and I guess that's where having the the actual nodes so you know their dependencies is awfully useful. Yes. So yeah, so, yeah, so I so so my my long term plan is to do this, get something out the door which doesn't have a really very optimal register allocator at all, and then do the deep dive into something which actually uses a sea of nodes and does a better register allocator. Okay. And, and so, so yeah, so maybe it makes sense then to generate all these nodes in the graph anyway, because it's sort of like, you know, then I'll show up as something that looks, what's that? Then. Yeah, it's yeah. like right now I, you know, I, I go from the scheduled code, which, you know, which looks like, uh, you know, like, like this, well, I was like you know, what we were looking at before, the the idea is that then it would it would go to this um, instruction selected code, and then it goes into the register allocator. And the reason that you know the reason I've got registers here is because these are calling convention registers. Right. Yeah. Totally get it. Um. Yeah. So. Yeah. So I'm my my tentative plan is to get rid of the code that does this blob blobs this out in line, and turn that turn this into a uh, pass on the graph that happens before scheduling. And then I have a bunch of this stuff that the scheduler then deals with and it puts wherever it puts. And then um, and then later, uh, then my instruction selection thing is very simple because most, most of the complex stuff is already done and everything's kind of one-to-one -one in the instruction selector. And then I go into the register alloc the sort of basic register allocator I've got, turn that into registers, and it won't do any sort of moving things around, um, but it'll probably insert a lot of spills. And then I'll have running code, and then later I'll build my inliner, I'll build my loop op loop optimizer, I'll build the proper register allocator. But people will already be able to use this. You're getting people to use it's a big deal. Yeah. And then you'll very rapidly realize you need better everything. Yeah. But and I'll figure first. out maybe which thing I need better of more. So yeah. I can well, I'm telling you, you know, rush allocation and inlining go hand in hand. You want better of both as soon as you want any of the above. Yeah. The, the rush allocator probably comes earlier than you think. And then as soon as you went inlining, you'll keep going back to that allocator. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, what, I, how I, I think that the register, I've been thinking about the register allocator a lot and 
you know, one of the things that I still have in mind is this idea of uh, being stackless. Um, since I've got like these really small programs. Oh. And so, and I never have to be called into, I have a complete knowledge of my lifetime. Yeah. So why not save yeah. all the stack calculations and spill into constant locations, yeah. except when I'm in a recursive function. And in that yeah. case, I actually have a stack, which I fall back to as an emergency. One of my first, you know, Fortran compilers didn't do recursion. All return addresses were put in a fixed location in memory and you just jumped to the contents of that location as a return. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't know. If, and further, if you can go to the point where there's not only no recursion, but I can align the set of things that A calls B calls C or A calls C calls whatever, and you have a, a DAG you can align, you can arrange. Everyone has a fixed return that they jump to. There's a, there's a bunch of hacks you can go <clears throat> next down the line where you effectively like think about it as inlining everything maximally, except you have sharing in the DAG. Yeah, the returns simplify down to I go one of three places and shit like that. You can, if you can prove yeah. a max depth of recursion, sometimes you can just do a function header that basically has four of the header on it. Oh yeah, yeah. And when That's you call the function, you pass in okay, what is my depth? And my depth is the offset into the array that has the copies of the headers of the function. Yeah. Uh, we used that trick on a radar system that wanted to have all memory allocated at compile time yes. and that meant no stack yes and the way they got away from the stack was that you had to have deterministic depth in every recursive i've, I've worked on such systems that early fortran was such a system yes yeah it was, it was not particularly hard. easy to work with i, I was doing landsat wow. processing on a ti mini computer refrigerator sized with real tapes from landsat data in the 80s Fine. But the point is that the Oom um killer never turned off the radar. Right. <laughs> oh, <laughs> fine. All right, Stefan, what, what were you trying to ask? Uh, <clears throat> well, I just, uh, I wondered two things. One was like, you said uh, you only uh, split the ranges when you run out of registers. Uh, was that correct? It's a In standard the... graph calling bridge state and graph calling allocator. So okay. if you failed a round of coloring, you yeah. also at that time collected things that didn't get live ranges that didn't get a color because they were too over constrained with too many neighbors. Mm. So you split them. I, I was considering splitting everything beforehand. I'm not doing that yet. Uh, so I, I just spill. If you if just I'm split over. everything, you typically can't clean up all the spills as much as you'd like. It's an easy way to get a running allocator. You split everything, mm. everything just spills to memory. You lazily reverse it as you can make it reverse and you get rid of some of the splits to memory, but you typically end with a much worse allocation than if you try to not split originally. But if your goal is to get a first pass working, yeah, this is what Darren's doing. Derek's doing, split everything. Go to memory, don't care, get it done, get it out the door. Okay. And I guess the second question was that uh, you said that uh, quickly you would want like better inlining and allocation and they go together. I guess that's because there's more pressure when you inline. Yeah. Or, yeah. Right. Okay. Sure. You call a lot of tiny little functions. And mm. if you just do a dumb thing every time you inline them, you end up with, you know, loads and storage and, and alignment issues everywhere and you drown in a sea of spill code. Now you want a mm. better allocator to clean them up. And suddenly, you know, instead of having 10 things live, you have 40 things live, then you have 200 things live and you must spill, you must spill live. If you spill everything like you're just suggesting, you know, first cut, everything spills. You never unwind it well. You get a lot of spill code. All your time mm -hmm. is loads and stores and all off the stack. Okay, I see. You, you, you want to come after the allocator. As you crank up inlining, you want to come back to the allocator and, and you, you just show some of your profiles. You'll start the mm -hmm. first thing, you'll run some code. Eh, it's okay, it does what it does, it's kind of suck. You look at the assembly, oh God, it's horrible. Ah! So you go back and say, okay, fix the register allocator and it cleans up and does okay. And then you go look at performance. You're calling in, calling out, these little tiny functions. You knew if this thing inlined, it would immediately turn into some other constant folding over here. There's an obvious performance gain to be had. So you crank up the inlining. Suddenly you got too many things live. The allocator loses its brain, spills everything. You get a horrible spill code and you back and forth you go. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. I see. There is a so reason you did that walkthrough with slides of sea of nodes. Do you want to someday do a walkthrough of like 
C2's register allocator? Probably should. Huh. I haven't got anything prepared. Actually, the young guys might look at the C uh, young guys. Oh, sorry. The noobs, whatever you want to call. <laughs> Why well, might want to see the sea of nodes talk? The easy SSA form. Here, here's how to make SSA easily. Cheap, obvious, easy way to do SSA form. But uh, then, you know, if people ask for it, I'll do it, or I'll do it offline for people who haven't seen this thing before. It's a 30 minutes of here's the fast, easy way to make SSA form. I'm afraid if I, I hear it, I'm going to try to optimize. It, I, go for it. I have heavily optimized it for the land of Java bytecodes, and I'm doing the same thing for AA, but. Yes. It, it I don't use. Very sorry. optimized. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I don't use fine nodes. I use, I just attach a conditional move or a move to some blocks that I insert later, basically. Uh, yeah. It's blocks that are conditionally run. Yeah, if you're, uh, you're only running some blocks. I mean, if you're only doing basic block level optimizations, don't care. Fine nodes are very useful as you decide to increase the scope of your optimizer. If you're running a game and the game gets good enough, you might be done with the whole optimizer thing. Set it to bed, pick it up later for a new project, whatever, but your requirements change, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I, I claim it's not the be all and end all for everything, but it's damn handy when you decide that more serious compilation is in order. All right, we're noon for California time. It's been two hours. Any last minute requests? All right, I'm going to declare. Did you this. switch time zones again? Yes. Oh. Yeah, I was going to say, oh, well. uh, going oh, through the whole time zone thing and not complaining about time zones. Came time late, stay. left late, whatever. I had people in the Discord chat. Wait, what? What? Yep. Time zone. What? It's yep. early. That's maybe in Don't two worry, weeks. I, I, you know, it confuses me too, except all my, well, <laughs> no, all my internet right. connected devices would all flip were the internet to be working. It is today, so it's all good. <laughs> yeah. I still long for the day when humanity is down to 24 time zones. <sighs> yeah, you'd think 24 ought to be enough. What do we have, like hundreds or is it thousands? It's a ridiculous count of time zones. It's just ludicrous. Hmm. Uh, the U.S. definitely does not need more than three. It's just like, please, why? <laughs> well, uh, there's like a study. I think I you mean, forgot Hawaii. Oh, four, maybe. Okay, fine. Hawaii. Everyone forgets Hawaii. But there's noticeable differences in people's amount of sleep, like across a time zone. So, like, you really need like half hour time zones. So, let me introduce you to my good friend, you know. <laughs> You know who come over and pay you a visit with his baseball bat on your kneecaps? <laughs> uh, you're not helping here, Alan. Fine. So, I don't have your new address. I guess, you know, if I need to mail you a bomb or something, I don't know. Oh, you want my address? Hmm. I have, um... I believe you're supposed to phrase that as, can I order some stickers? If you want stickers, send me your address. <laughs> You'll get mine then on the envelope. <laughs> yeah. hmm. I'll just wait till there's shirts again. Yeah, okay. Shirts were fun. It's too hot. I mean, yeah. too cold for shirts yet. I, I got we, another three months. We no, have I a few. Two months before I'm going to start wearing my shirt. So maybe we'll bring the shirts out again. I think yeah. I'm actually now really out of shirts. So if there's a hue and a cry for shirts, I'll have to order, and then it has to be a minimum order number and all that kind of stuff. You could get sweaters, you know? Those have cost a lot more. Oh. Aren't there print-on-demand places where you can just uh, put the logo and they'll put it on mugs and sweaters and- Right, pens. that's right. And the, and the answer is those cost a lot more. Oh, okay. So I bought cheap, plain T-shirts, and my wife did her cricket thing and put all the logos on. Oh, print on demand, it cost you double for any of the above. I didn't realize that was a thing. Oh, print on demand. I assumed they had been printed that way from the printer. Oh, oh no, she oh uh, she makes stuff here like like you know it's a it's a three D card. So this is Cricut is basically a 
a cutting machine that does high precision cutting like a 3D printer, but it's for paper and paper like substances, vinyl and iron on stick ons and little heavier stuff. You can do thicker card stock and whatever. So she makes 3D cards all the time. And we have a bunch of wall uh, art that is boxed bias relief with 3D things and stuff. After you quit, that, that was going to end it, but she, she wants to run show off her handiwork. No, the, the, the cricket is cool. You it's got one? interesting moments where it's like, oh, I have to compile this cutting instruction into a postscript file so I can yes. send it to the cricket, which is software thinks it's a printer. So it's, oh, wow. it's you know, Thanksgiving. It's being, That's really nice. Yeah, yeah, the fun stuff. Yeah. Oh. yeah, if you thought the last time I was in a fight with my printer, this would have been made better if my printer had a razor blade. Cricket is the device for you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think I think we're done here. Until we uh, until we fight with our printers again. This is uh, Don Quixote tilting at printers. <laughs> um. Till next week. Bye. 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 Bye.